Okay, um, welcome everyone to uh, this online screening and question and answer session. Sorry for the slight delay, we had a few technical problems, but um, we'll be up and running very soon. So the, the documentary is about Ukraine. Um, 30 years ago, Ukraine declared its independence from the USSR, 24th of August, 1991. So tomorrow is the uh, 30th anniversary of its independence. And uh, the documentary is made by Paul uh, Sherbatovich. Uh, he has looked into uh, how Ukraine has fared since then uh, and its relations with uh, neighbors like Poland, Hungary, Romania, Lithuania, Slovakia. Uh, he's addressed various big issues, potential corruption, the relations between the Ukraine and the EU, um, issues relating to the US election process and Ukraine and China. So there's a, there's a lot here. I'll leave it to Paul to uh, carry on explaining some more and then we'll start the documentary and then we'll have question and answers. Yes, so good afternoon, Julian. Thank you very much. Yes, so the point of the documentary was to have a look back at the last 30 years and see where Ukraine has been going wrong in terms of its uh, foreign policy, how things, how that affects uh, things in the domestic climate and to look to the future to see how perhaps Ukraine can remedy these things going forward. The announcement from Moscow had had a shocking impact across the world. Mikhail Gorbachev was ousted today. Thirty years ago, the world was thunderstruck how quickly the evil empire of the Soviet Union fell apart. The USSR ceased to exist in a matter of days. Fifteen new countries appeared. There were, of course, many crises along the post-Soviet journey, but almost all of them succeeded in becoming countries with real economies and politics. Only one of them has been considered by some to have suffered three decades of disappointment. At the beginning of the 1990s, Ukraine ranked 60th in the world economy. Nowadays, it is competing with Moldova for the status of the poorest European country. According to the World Bank, real GDP data of 166 countries from 1990 until now, only two countries have gone backwards. Ukraine, minus 36.1%, and Georgia, minus 0.8%. Сегодня Украина на душу населения, ВВП на душу населения показатель самый низкий или второй снизу, там, смотря как считать, или по показателю ВВП, или по паритету покупательной способности, или самый низкий в Европе, или на втором месте после Молдовы, да, что, в общем-то, не соответствует нашим возможностям. While some achieved spectacular growth, for example, China increased its GDP 15-fold in the last 30 years, Ukraine seems to have been going down the drain. Once a proud industrial country, now some disparagingly refer to it as a banana republic, selling grain, ferrous metals, ore and slag. And because of this success, people are fleeing in all directions. In 1991, there were almost 52 million people in Ukraine. But by 2018, there were only 42 million left. That's according to official data. But many experts believe in reality that only 36 million remain as many residents have in reality moved abroad. So what have the new hetmen done to drown such a country? It seems they went a little crazy as soon as they stopped having to report to Moscow. Having united with bandits from the 90s, successive presidents created a lot of oligarchs and they divide everything according to their own interests. Kuchma, Kabachnik, Asika, a people, Kuchmy финансово-промышленные группы. Вот это был 93-94 год. И что они как локомотивы, это объединение генералов промышленности, это объединение торговых каких-то, скажем, торговой буржуазии компрадорской, ростовщической, это привлечение 
как бы денег с разных структур, плюс бандиты, плюс КГБ, в результате получат там мощные локомотивы, которые потом вытянут всю страну. Я тогда предупреждал, что ничем хорошим это не закончится. Oligarchs took over Ukraine in no time. Its territory turned into a bunch of fiefdoms which belonged to a private club of kleptomaniacs. The authority simply served their interests. They don't care about the economy, its competitiveness or future of the nation at all. In 2021, Forbes magazine shocked Ukrainians when it published the country's rich list. Despite the coronavirus crisis, all the oligarchs greatly increased their income. For example, in June 2020, Ukraine's richest man, Rinat Akhmetov, was worth $2.8 billion. Yet in 2021, his wealth had ballooned to $7.6 billion. Another oligarch, Viktor Pinchuk, increased his fortune from $1.4 billion to $2.5 billion. In all, seven billionaires fattened their wallets while most ordinary people suffered as COVID hit the world. The oligarchs are constantly greedy for the next billion. They don't care how Ukraine looks. In 30 years, foreign policy will become rudimentary. All attempts to establish good relations with neighbors and distant countries ended up in failure or conflict or both. Now a so-called elite is stimulating nationalism and paramilitary groups to garner government support. But the incompetence of the authority is remarkable. It's simply impossible to create something outside the country in these circumstances. The conflict with Russia looks like it will never end. The loss of Crimea and part of the Donetsk Basin made the conflict stronger. What about the others? People used to say that Poland was Ukraine's lawyer in the European Union. Now the friendship is over because Kiev became a fan of so-called freedom fighters, including those whom Poland accuses of massacring Poles. As a result of the annual torchlight procession in Kiev and other cities, monuments to UN UIA soldiers and recognition of them as combatants, the friendship with Poland was lost. Poland Ambassador Bartosz Tchikowski and Israel Ambassador Joel Leon criticized the torchlight procession in honor of the 111th birthday of Ukrainian nationalism ideologist Stepan Bandera, which took place in Ukrainian cities on the 1st of January. In a common statement published on the Polish diplomatic mission website, it was mentioned that similar activities should be condemned once and for all. Poland condemns the winter of 1943 massacres of Poles in Wołynia, forced eviction of ethnic Poles and destruction of entire settlements as an act against humanity. Simply put, genocide. Преступление, совершенное на Волыне, беспрецедентное, если говорить об уровне жестокости. Речь идет об очень страшных вещах. Мы не можем об этом забыть ни при каких обстоятельствах. Преступление такого масштаба, преступление против поляков, нельзя игнорировать и преуменьшать его важность, избегая слова «геноцид». Это был геноцид, и я хочу это подчеркнуть. However, the word genocide is avoided in Ukraine, although even local historians say that reconciliation is possible only through the recognition of old mistakes. A friend yesterday, but a direct obstacle on the way to the European Union today. Minister for Foreign Affairs of Poland, Witold Waszczykowski, announced directly, our message is simple, you will not enter Europe with Bandera. But Kiev keeps to its own path. On the 2nd of July 2021, Parliament registered a project for the celebration of the 80th anniversary of the establishment of the Ukrainian insurgent army and the return of the title Heroes of Ukraine to Stepan Bandera and Roman Shukevich. That's how the Hungarian foreign minister described the law on education, which was adopted by the Verkova Rada of Ukraine in 2017. The rector of the Hungarian Institute in Transcarpathia called the law a return to the time of Stalin. As soon as Hungarians complained, their cultural center in Uzahorod was blown up. Radicals openly hinted to locals that they would make it hot for them unless they stopped interfering with the process of Ukrainianization. On the other hand, there was the Security Service of Ukraine, which pressured the Transcarpathian Hungarian Cultural Association. 
був проголосований новий закон щодо застосування мов меншин. Він просто уб'є можливість використовувати мови меншин у державному управлінні, у ЗМІ та культурі. Плюс миротворець склав список з угорцями, журналістами, міністром закордонних справ, угорцями, які живуть в Україні, і їх оголосили ворогами України. Зареєстрували петицію для збору підписів за депортацію угорців із Закарпаття. Знаєте, у 21 столітті висувати такі пропозиції неприйнятно. Проблема з венграми, як і ряд інших питань по язикам, вирішиться в Україні тоді, коли буде реальна язикова політика відповідати європейським нормам, а не псевдоєвропейським нормам і націонал-радикальному виді. Romanians also suffered from language repression. Their minority is more modest, but they also suffered the same way. Ethnic Romanians are closer to Bucharest than to Kiev, but they will have to learn Ukrainian. The scandal over the insurance of Romanian passports by Romania hit Bucharest very painfully. Ukraine has made a lot of noise, but then went ahead and issued its own passports. President of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, has signed a decree simplifying the procedure of issuing passports to foreigners. First of all, it concerned Russians who were persecuted in their homeland, but citizens of other countries might also get a passport. And when Ukraine was arguing about Zimni Island, it stepped on Romanians' toes the most. Everything could have been solved in a friendly way. The Treaty on Good Neighborliness, Friendly Relations and Cooperation had been in force since 1997. The demarcation of borders in the Black Sea was stipulated in that treaty. But Kiev annoyed the Romanians so much that they eventually applied to the International Court of Justice and won their case in 2009. They got 80% of the shelf. Ukraine was left with a piece of rock which Kiev stubbornly considered to be an island. In 2020, together with journalists, Ukrainian border guards unexpectedly visited Zimini Island. It was for the first time in 12 years. They made videos and left. It looked like Kiev officials were not very interested in the stone laying in the middle of the sea. The shelf and Ukrainian greediness were a real reason of the visit, as the shelf resources were estimated in 10 million tons of oil and 100 billion cubic meters of gas. In 2014, Kiev stopped taking gas from Gazprom. Slovakia was the only country that supplied it to Ukraine. The Slovaks even built a gas interconnector to Ukraine from the Velke Kapushanik gas distribution station. That's allowed Kiev to save $3 billion. Most countries would surely be extremely grateful for such a service, but apparently not Ukraine. Ukraine wanted virtual reverse flow. The concept being Slovakia buys gas from Russia, which is transited through Ukraine. Before it leaves Ukraine, they are allowed to siphon off an agreed amount. Slovakia would make up the shortfall by taking gas from, say, German LNG terminals, which Ukraine had paid for. So the idea of virtual reverse flow was good, but its implementation was not. Kiev officials filed a complaint to the EU, where they called the contract between Gazprom and the Slovak Eurostream illegal. To say the Slovaks were shocked is an understatement. Bratislava did not support the idea regarding virtual reverse. They wanted to discuss all in details, so Ukraine's grandstanding could cost Slovakia, as well as Europe, a lot in general. Unable to get what it wanted, Ukraine, like an offended teenager, made a series of demarches. First, it disrupted the meeting of the Visegrad Four, Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia and Hungary, which was to take place in 2014 in ivano Frankivs. The Slovak representatives who chaired Visegrad had energy saving projects for Ukraine. But a week before the event, Kiev announced there would be no meeting. And the last minute cancellation of President Poroshenko's visit to the Globsec Anniversary Security Conference in Bratislava was a personal offense for Slovakia. 
That event is of great importance for Slovaks. The organizers announced that Poroshenko had confirmed his participation and was going to speak at the presidential panel devoted to Ukraine together with three other countries' leaders. Lithuania is a close political ally of Ukraine. Vilnius constantly appealed to all the structures of the European Union to help Kiev through its difficult years of 2013 to 40. Yet then we see a masterclass how to betray friends. The Belarus nuclear plant, just 50 kilometers away from Vilnius, is a huge problem for Lithuania. What does Ukraine have to do with it? Well, it simply keeps purchasing electricity from Belarus and therefore indirectly finances the project. Будівельник електростанції Росія не лише піддала ризику здоров'я жителів регіону, але й намагається використати проєкт електростанції для розширення свого впливу. Зростаюча крихкість Білорусі означає пряму загрозу для інтересів не лише Литви, але й України. Тому сьогодні хочу прилюдно попросити владу України та її народ підтримати позицію країн Балтії стосовно білоруської атомної електростанції та не купувати електроенергії, виробленої в Островці. Back in March this year, Lithuania's government pleaded with nations not to support the Belarusian nuclear plant. Kiev defiantly refused to listen, only announcing the termination of the electricity import from Belarus in July after having a quarrel with Belarus itself. Before and during the Russian-Ukrainian war for all six years, Belarus was one of Ukraine's partners. Alexander Lukashenko put Ukrainian products in Belarusian wrapping and sold to the Russian market, provided Minsk as a place for negotiations, visited administration of the president of Ukraine. For Ukraine, the Republic of Belarus is a strategic trade partner, and also the fifth trade partner in the world. Сьогодні вже говорили, що у нас цифри тут ну, майже співпадають щодо того, що цього року ми досягли 4,5-4,6 мільярда, ну не рублів, а доларів Сполучених Штатів Америки. Цього року ми сподіваємося, що це буде 5,3 мільярда. But everything changed in 2020 after Ukraine joined the so-called Alliance of Western Loyalty from the Black Sea to the Baltic, including Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Poland. The first thing that Kiev did was to refuse to recognize the results of the Belarusian elections. The Verkhovna Rada adopted a statement in which the outcome of the Belarus elections was criticized. Members of parliament said that the expression of will was neither free nor fair. Outspoken MP of the European Solidarity Party, Oleksiy Koncharenko, called Lukashenko a vassal of Putin. Finally, good neighborly relations were ruined by President Zelensky, who have unofficially annulled diplomatic relations with Belarus. On the 23rd of May, 2021, a Ryanair passenger flight flying from Athens to Vilnius landed in Minsk as a result of reports about a bomb aboard. A MiG-29 fighter plane was launched to accompany the liner. After landing, Roman Protasevich, former chief editor of Next to TV channel, which is considered to be extremist in Belarus, was detained. The plane continued its flight. Western countries criticized Belarus and terminated flights there. Ukraine took such actions as an example, forbidding Ukrainian planes to fly to Belarus and Belarusian planes to fly to Ukraine. The official explanation for such a step sounded like care for its passengers, but still it was also admitted that the decision was political. Little Moldova suffered enough from Kiev. Back in 2005, Viktor Yushchenko had a visit from the leader of the unrecognized Transistrian Republic Igor Smirnov in Kiev. The world was watching it with big surprise. Some people even thought the Ukraine wanted to get some territory from Moldova. 
Then the fifth president of Ukraine, Petro Poroshenko, lifted sanctions on a metallurgical plant in Transnistria, despite the fact it was feeding separatists as they fought with Ukraine. Soon everyone understood the reason. It happened because Ukraine kept exporting scrap metal to Transnistria using the intermediary connected with the local oligarch Volodymyr Plakotinyuk. This man is understood to be Poroshenko's business partner. Everything was suddenly clear. And finally, Zelensky's administration severely embarrassed itself in Moldova. The story of Judge Shahouse's kidnapping is obvious. Kishinev conducted an investigation and found that the people who ordered and made it happen were from Ukraine. Judge Chaos disappeared in Kishinev on the 3rd of April. He was hiding there because in Ukraine he was suspected of corruption. Chaos was seeking asylum. Legal cases were prepared against him, but there was no final sentence. In 2016, Chaos was caught taking a $150,000 bribe. Judicial immunity helped him to run away abroad and avoid imprisonment. In an interview, Maida Sandu, new president of Moldova, said the situation with Judge House's kidnapping had damaged relations with Ukraine. Alexander Stoyanoglo, Prosecutor General of Moldova, recently announced the termination of the House case investigation. According to the police, Ukraine's special services were involved in the kidnapping. Surprisingly, it turns out it is possible to screw up not only in the neighborhood, but also far away as well. Who would have thought that Kiev would dare to publicly slap the USA in the face? Famous political lobbyist Paul Manafort was sentenced to seven and a half years of imprisonment for meddling in the USA presidential elections in 2016. It turned out that Manafort, as well as many other people who ordered server hacking of the Democratic Party, were operating in Ukraine. This information was provided by documents of the USA Ministry of Justice. The case of Hunter Biden, the current U.S. president's son, immensely affected Ukrainian-American relations. President Zelensky tried to find some excuses, but nothing good came out of it. His office kept asking for an official visit to Washington, but as of now, it still hasn't happened. Hunter Biden found himself in the center of a political scandal after Donald Trump's phone call with Volodymyr Zelensky. Trump was demanding Ukraine reopen the investigation against Burisma, the company whose board of directors included Biden Jr. Before this phone call, Trump suspended the transfer of $400 million for military help in Ukraine, and his representatives believe that Zelensky's visit to the White House had something to do with the success of Trump in reopening the investigation. But that is not all. Recently, David Arakhamia, chairman of the pro-government Servant of the People Party, enthusiastically congratulated the Chinese Communist Party of its 100th anniversary, expressing his fascination in the party's achievements and even offered China opportunities in Ukraine. That wouldn't be so bad if the United States had not declared China the number one threat to its national interests. Мне посол Китая подарил собрание сочинений книги господина председателя. Я читаю и я восхищаюсь. And all this nonsense was taking place at the time when Zelensky was preparing for a possible visit to the USA. Though with China itself, Ukraine scored an epic own goal. It deprived the Chinese the chance to buy controlling stake in Motor Sich after they'd invested billions of dollars in its development over five years. The annual general meeting that was supposed to make the decision about the sale of the majority stake in Motor Sich joint stock company was stopped by the SSU. 
The National Security Council of Ukraine stated that the enterprise would not be sold off, but instead would be nationalized. Chinese investors of Mossasic called such attempts unacceptable and threatened lawsuits. To get them under control, President Volodymyr Zelensky imposed sanctions. And having argued with most of its former partners, Ukraine got stuck. The West or the East? The praise of the Chinese communists from the Sermon of the People Party were definitely not in vain. It was a courtesy to a possible creditor, which could give big money instead of the stubborn IMF. The West gives help only in exchange for reforms, and there are less and less of those. The icing on the cake is the recent blackmail of Zelensky at the International Conference in Batumi. The Ukrainian leader was scarring Europe with the threats from the North after criticizing the Eastern Partnership format. Євросоюзу, стратегічного бачення цілей Східного партнерства робить цей формат не таким предметним, напівживим. Нам не потрібен саміт заради саміту. У нас гинуть люди, у нас війна. Нам потрібне політичне наповнення та геополітичне бачення майбутнього цієї ініціативи. Інакше... Чесно кажучи, не зрозуміла доцільність цього взагалі. Наступний саміт має показати чітке бачення відносин з найближчими партнерами з боку Європейського Союзу. Zelensky's predecessor, Poroshenko, did exactly the same. However, the current Ukrainian government went even further. There are no general phrases anymore. Instead, there are direct accusations of European leaders who organized the European Union agenda. Zelensky's office directly blamed Germany for surrendering Ukrainian interests. <laughs> Needless to say that the head of the ruling party, David Arakamia, is complaining to the whole world that Ukraine got rid of nuclear weapons. According to him, keeping it would make it possible to scare everyone around them and demand money. We could blackmail the whole world and we could get money for its maintenance the same way as it happens in many other countries around the world. This is what the current government representative said. Ukraine is clowning around in front of the West. It constantly keeps whining and at the same time admits that external management and foreigners taking key positions is nonsense. Almost all Western guest workers have been removed. The last ones were recently kicked out of a Naftagaz national joint stock company along with the head of the management. The head of the supervisory board was fired in contradiction to many laws. Even the United States Department of State protested. So are any good neighborly relations possible, taking into account such actions? Probably not. Obviously, the only thing that inhibits the civilized world from giving up on Kiev is the understanding that the good-for-nothing political elite is not the whole country. There are many ordinary people who are very unhappy. In 2020, Ukraine entered top five of the most unfortunate countries of the world. Total happiness index of the Ukrainians in 2020 was 14%. In 2019, this index was twice as high at 33%. According to researchers, the economy and happiness of people are not always interconnected. Sometimes it is possible to live in a poor country and still be satisfied with life, as we can see with residents of Costa Rica or Panama, for example. However, Ukraine is both poor and miserable. The community understands that Ukrainians are trusting, romantic, and believe in a brighter future that the next Messiah will bring. Current President Zelensky is proof of such expectations. Unfortunately, dreaming has bad consequences because already for three decades, leaders chosen by the people have been leading Ukraine into an abyss. Um, yeah, hello everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed that documentary. Um, I, I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, I think just just to help all the viewers, because there were just so many 
um, multiple messages and and issues and all sorts in there to help all the viewers. Paul, could could in a few lines, could you just say uh, explain what your key message is um, relating to this documentary? Absolutely, Julian. Yeah, I think the the point of the documentary, looking at the last thirty years with the anniversary coming up tomorrow, uh, the, the idea was to look at Ukraine's international relations and to see whether or not they're heading in the wrong direction because they seem to be alienating a lot of their close allies, their former allies, their neighbours. They seem to be uh, betting all their chips on a relationship with China, which in itself isn't a bad thing. China, of course, is a, is a huge player in the world economy, but Ukraine also needs to keep an eye on, on its close ties with its neighbours. And the last few years, we've seen that they've fallen out with pretty much everyone. Okay, yeah. And um... I mean, do you want to go over any other particular issues relating to your to the documentary? Well, well um, there were a few points. I mean, we mentioned that the the idea of the the nationalists as well, how the Ukrainian government would would handle the the you know the the sort of swing almost towards nationalism is a difficult to balance for the government because on the one hand they know that the supporting these nationalist movements is going to further alienate countries like Poland, but then at the same time governments have to go for where there is popular support. And if there's a, a surge in nationalism in the Ukraine, then the government are going to try and harness that to, to get voters. So it's it's left Ukraine in a, in a difficult position now because they want to keep their own citizens happy. But by doing so, it may well be that they're further alienating their neighbours. Yeah. And, and in relation to the EU, what what's um, where are its prospects there? You know, that there's... Well, I, you know, I think... Um, you know, I think it was uh, Denis uh, Schmigal who said that he would expect Ukraine to be uh, applying for EU membership within the next five to, to ten years. Um, I think it's difficult to put a time frame on it because there are so many uh, diplomatic uh, issues that first need to be uh, resolved in terms of uh, the issues with Poland, with Hungary. We've seen uh, issues with Slovakia as well in terms of the, uh, the gas pipeline. And as, Pol as the Polish uh, foreign minister said, because Ukraine keeps recognizing the, uh, the nationalist leaders as national heroes, that is going to be a sticking point for Poland. So going forward, I think the EU would like to have uh, Ukraine uh, within, its, uh, within its community because it's a, it could potentially be a, a strong uh, economic partner. But there, there are all these diplomatic issues that need to be resolved. Uh, and, and what about um, Ukraine's aspirations to join NATO? Well, I think it, it's similar to, again, from a, from a, a sort of world peace point of view, I think most countries are always looking to, to unite, to have larger uh, cooperation rather than sort of being going off on their own. So I think with, with NATO, that they would, be, um, they would be keen to have Ukraine as a member. But of course, as well as the, the issues of nationalism and, and having fallouts with their neighbours, there is also this, this aspect of the conflict with Russia, which is a long way from being resolved. And I think that NATO would like to see some sort of resolution, some sort of harmony with that before they would then uh, look to make Ukraine a full member. OK. Um, yeah, and uh, I th yeah, it would be interesting to get your view on what, what the biggest failure for Ukraine has been in the last 30 years of independence, perhaps the biggest failure and the biggest, biggest success, perhaps both. Well, I think, I think the, the, the biggest failure, I would say, is that Ukraine is still trying to find its identity. It does straddle the East and the West, which, which does make it difficult because, of course, there are those that feel that Ukraine should be more aligning to Europe and those that feel that Ukraine should be aligning more to the East as well. And I think that the, the, the biggest failure is that lack of identity and perhaps the fact that successive governments have promised that the levels of corruption, the levels of oligarch influence would be reduced and really with each new government, with each new president, it doesn't seem to be much of an improvement in that. And, and as a result of that, it's the, the regular Ukrainian people that are suffering on a, on a daily basis as the country isn't developing economically like it should be. Okay, um, I mean, I think that's all that I can think of, um, but perhaps, you know, is there anything else you'd like to say, you know, any uh, other I would issues? Just that uh, if there was any, perhaps any uh, freezing during the, the live stream, this, uh, this uh, uh, the documentary is available on uh, my news channel on PS News and Sport. 
and that will be available uh, to, to view online. And we will look to get to the answers to the uh, to the press conference that we've just had to, to look to post those on there as well. Okay, uh, I mean, I don't see any other questions uh, coming, so I guess yeah, we can we can bring it to a close. Um, yeah, if you if, if you've got one last message, perhaps. You can well, I'd like to thank everyone who've, uh, who's uh, logged on this afternoon, who's, who's watched the, the documentary. I hope it's uh, provoked some thought. And the aim of the documentary is to try and shed some light on the situation, but also to try and give perhaps a roadmap for a, for a better future. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks to everyone.